It's the worst air disaster in Russian history. This is Skywatch TV for Monday, November 2nd, 2015. I'm Derek Gilbert. A Russian Airbus A321, Kalavia Flight 7K9268, crashed in the Sinai Peninsula Saturday. All 224 people on board were killed. You see a picture behind me that's gone viral on the internet. 10-month-old Darina Gorova, or Gromova, looking at airplanes through an airport window in Russia before boarding a plane to Egypt. She flew there with her parents, Alexei and Tatiana Gromova, both of whom were also on the doomed aircraft. Darina was one of 17 children killed when the plane came down. The Islamic State wasted no time taking credit for the crash. Experts in Russia and Egypt say that just isn't possible. The plane was cruising at 31,000 feet before it began its fatal descent, well outside the range of shoulder-fired rockets, which the Islamic State is believed to possess. However, a number of major airlines are rerouting their flights so they do not cross over the Sinai Peninsula, making it effectively a no-fly zone. The airline says that the crew was incapacitated somehow prior to the crash, and that's why there was no distress call. It added that serious structural failure caused by an external force was responsible for the crash, possibly a bomb. This plane passed a check for metal fatigue in 2014, an inspection that's required on this type of craft every six years. The investigation into the cause continues. But this does raise a question. Is Russia's intervention in Syria putting its citizens at risk? Some experts believe that President Putin's involvement in Syria is dangerous, since his goal is to prop up the government of Bashar al-Assad. His strategy must include destroying the Sunni uprising in Syria and Iraq. Realizing this, so-called moderate rebel groups may find themselves forced to align with the Islamic State. And as we've mentioned before, there are areas in Russia, such as Chechnya, which are predominantly Sunni and which have gone to war with Russia for independence in the not too distant past. Well, complicating things, on Friday, the White House announced that the U.S. is putting boots on the ground in Syria. Now, these, of course, are besides the ones that are already there. I mean, who do we think was doing the training in the so-called train and equip program that we recently canceled? And despite the fact, of course, that President, uh, President uh, Obama has said on no fewer than 16 occasions publicly that the U.S. would never put boots on the ground in Syria. According to the White House, no more than 50 Special Forces soldiers will be deployed to Syria to advise and assist so-called moderate opposition forces in northern Syria. However, Secretary of Defense Ashton Carter admits that those troops will be in harm's way. And as we learned last month during the raid by Kurdish forces in northern Iraq to free prisoners being held by the IS, that may mean that U.S. troops will actually engage in fighting on the ground in Syria. Now, some of the war hawks in Washington, like Senator John McCain, McCain that is, are calling this uh, woefully inadequate for the challenge we face there. Earlier Friday, news agencies quoted other military sources as saying that in addition to the special ops troops, additional aircraft such as F-15s and A-10s would be deployed to the Incirlik Air Base in Turkey. Now, it was at least somewhat amusing Friday at the press conference watching White House spokesman Josh Earnest try to explain to reporters why putting boots on the ground in Syria was not putting boots on the ground in Syria, but uh, reporters, in my humble opinion, weren't asking the right question. According to what we've been told, and as near as we can discern from what the Pentagon has already done, our guys will likely be embedded with the Kurdish forces in Syria, the YPG, the Peshmerga, fighting against the Islamic State and against the government of Bashar al-Assad. Now, the YPG is aligned with the PKK, another Kurdish political party that operates in Iraq. Our allies, the Turks, have been bombing the PKK in Iraq. So the question to ask is, how does the Pentagon plan to put our special forces onto the battlefield in Syria without bringing them into direct conf confrontation with the Russians, the Turkish Air Force, Iranian Republican Guards, or Hezbollah, especially if and when Russian and Iranian forces mop up the uh, rebels around Aleppo and begin pushing eastward toward Iraq. If I had to guess, and this is a guess, I would be willing to bet that there are men and women inside the Pentagon and the Kremlin staying awake at night trying to figure out ways to avoid World War III. Speaking of Turkey, the, parliament, or the party rather, of President Tayyip Erdogan 
regained a majority in the parliament in elections over the weekend, claiming enough seats to form a government without having to include other political parties, but not enough to rewrite the Constitution to expand the power of the presidency, which seems to be President Erdogan's goal. The former prime minister apparently wants to create a powerful executive uh, office for the president, similar to what we have in the United States, although parenthetically I'll add it's not supposed to be that way according to the Constitution. Um, Still, this does give President Erdogan more clout to pursue his political and military goals in Syria. It is definitely a tangled web in that part of the world. And American policy there, in my opinion, is best described as incoherent. The United States in Iraq is forced to maintain a loose alliance with Shiite militia groups there. Or explain to the world why we are not supporting groups that are actively fighting the Islamic State. The problems, of course, based on the lack of results from a full year of dropping bombs in the Islamic State, the government in Baghdad isn't convinced that we're actually trying to eliminate the IS. And you can bet that Iran, which backs the political parties ruling in Baghdad, is whispering exactly that into the ears of every Shiite politician in Baghdad. And the militia groups in Iraq are basically the same guys who are fighting for President Assad in Syria as the battle for Aleppo continues, fighting against Sunni militia groups that the United States is supplying with anti-tank missiles. Now, if that isn't enough war and rumors of war for you, NATO nations are discussing the possibility of increasing the number of soldiers on the Russian border and putting them under formal NATO command, possibly four battalions, which could be as many as 4,000 soldiers. Russia's ambassador to NATO said, the creeping increase in NATO's military presence on our frontiers is testing our patience. And China is threatening war over America's refusal to acknowledge its sovereignty over waters in the South China Sea. Last week, the U.S. Navy sent a guided missile destroyer to within 12 nautical miles of Chinese man-made islands in the South China Sea. While nothing happened, which is good news for those of us who don't actually want to live through World War III, China's naval commander told his American counterpart that a minor incident could lead to war if the U.S. doesn't stop these dangerous, provocative acts. The problem for American government and military leaders is it may feel compelled to continue these dangerous, provocative acts or demonstrate to our allies in the region like the Philippines and Taiwan that the United States is not as omnipotent as we'd like them to believe. China, by the way, has uh, scrapped its one-child policy. The last 35 years, they've um, only allowed couples to have one child, which has reduced the population there by about 400 million people. Um, Communist Party officials now saying couples are free to have two children, which is good news for those couples who like a boy and a girl. One of the other consequences of the one-child policy was it resulted in an aging population as the population contracted and a gender imbalance as couples limited to one child preferred to have a boy to a girl because a boy, it was believed, could better care for his aging parents. And so there was widespread Uh, sex-selective abortion. With all the grim geopolitical news toward the end of last week and over the weekend, maybe this sign in the heavens is appropriate. We told you about the asteroid nicknamed Spooky on our Sci Friday broadcast. Flew by the Earth on Halloween at a distance of 1.3 times the distance of the moon, relatively close in astronomical terms. Uh, Astronomers have determined that Spooky is actually a dead comet rather than an asteroid. And they managed to catch this picture as it flew by. It looks like a human skull. The live televised exorcism we told you about that took place Friday night turned out to be a dud. The stunt, which was broadcast from the house in suburban St. Louis, that, uh, or where the events that inspired the novel and the movie The Exorcist took place, was disappointing to those who tuned in hoping for something spectacular. As I said last week, the spirits that reportedly tormented the boy, not only as Roland Doe, were attached to him and not to the house, so that's no surprise. And whatever spirits might have been in the area probably find it more to their use to convince us that they don't really exist. One of my favorite movie lines relates to this, comes from the 1995 film The Usual Suspects. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. And on this point, I agree with the Archdiocese of St. Louis, which issued a warning in advance of the broadcast, saying that any attempt to use exorcism for entertainment 
exposes all participants to potential future demonic attack. A new religion is growing predominantly in the technologically advanced West. It is the subject of the forthcoming documentary film Inhuman, The Next and Final Phase of Man is Here. And tomorrow night on Skywatch TV, we begin the first of two interviews to discuss the transhumanism movement and the making of the film Inhuman. Tom Horn and Sharon K. Gilbert join me in studio. You can see Skywatch TV tomorrow night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 8.30 p.m. Central Time on the Christian Television Network, which is broadcast on satellite television, DirecTV Channel 376, Dish Network Channel 267, the Glory Star Satellite Channel 117. You can also watch it on the Christian Television Network's website. They have a live web stream. You'll find their website at ctnonline.com. And later this week, of course, the program will be posted to the Skywatch TV channel on YouTube and on Roku. Registration continues for the 2016 Rocky Mountain International Prophecy Conference. We'd love to see you there, but we're limiting registration to the first 1,000 people who sign up. July 14th through the 17th, 2016, in Colorado Springs. Speakers include Bill Salas, L.A. Marzulli, Chuck Missler, Timothy Mahoney, producer of the film Patterns of Evidence, and many others. Uh, again, registration open now at prophecywatchers.com. And my email is open for your comments, questions, and suggestions. Uh, in fact, it was very helpful to receive notice early this morning that uh, somehow I had neglected to post the uh, Sci Friday episode to the Skywatch TV channel on Roku. So uh, there is some benefit to taking advantage of this uh, email address. Again, dgilbert at skywatchtv.com if you have something you'd like to pass along, and I'll respond as quickly as I can. Thank you for watching. As we keep watch, I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is Skywatch TV. Coming exclusively from Skywatch TV for a very limited time starting November 17th, 2015. When you purchase the new documentary film Inhuman and the companion book Dead Pets Don't Lie from Skywatch TV, you'll receive the largest giveaway in Skywatch TV history. An unprecedented $300 in free books, audio sets, and DVDs to add to your library or to give away as gifts during this holiday season. Included in this limited time giveaway are never before offered free audio sets. Over 30 hours of the most sought after interviews in history with global experts combined on a special two disc volume set discussing the unfolding genetic Armageddon now underway and what you need to know to survive the future. Featuring something transhumanism this way comes. The coming replacement humans. The days of Noah. The coming zombie apocalypse. Conspiracy theory. Psychotronic warfare. Also, for a very limited time, in addition to the never before offered free best selling audio sets, if you order before this special offer expires, you'll also receive the multi part Skywatch TV special investigative report on Inhuman the documentary and Dead Pets Don't Lie. The award winning book, Forbidden Gates. Pandemonium's Engine. The best-selling DVD by dog behavior expert Joe Artis, The Natural Dog Training Method. The breakthrough book for pet enthusiasts everywhere, Do Our Pets Go to Heaven? Two additional mystery books with a $40 value. And if you're one of the first 3,000 customers to place your order during this limited time offer, you will also receive absolutely free the groundbreaking WorldNet Daily film, The Last Pope, featuring Tom Horn. Place your order beginning November 17th, 2015. Altogether, the never before offered free six full audio series on a two disc volume set plus the five free books and two additional DVDs total an astounding $300 giveaway to add to your library or to give away as gifts during this holiday season. So it's urgent that beginning November 17th, 2015, you order the new documentary film Inhuman and the companion book Dead Pets Don't Lie for only $39.95 to also receive the largest giveaway in Skywatch TV history. But please understand this offer will end without notification and is on a first come first serve basis starting November 17th. So be sure to visit skywatchtv.com to follow the countdown to the greatest giveaway in Skywatch TV history. Order the new documentary film Inhuman and the companion book Dead Pets Don't Lie for only $39.95 to also receive the largest giveaway in Skywatch TV history.